How old were you when you realized you were never going to be an astronaut? If you're anything like most kids, it's probably around the time you were old enough to Google astronaut requirements and realize the job that takes a thousand hours of pilot time and a PhD in engineering or math was a bit out of your reach. Becoming an astronaut is one of the most selective processes on or off Earth. It's right up there with all the other single-digit acceptance rates, like getting into Harvard or, an even more competitive example, becoming a Chick-fil-A franchisee. <laughs> Every year, NASA boasts 18,000 applicants for their astronaut school. And you know how many they'll pick? 10. I find this to be kind of sad because I know there are way more than 10 kids out there who want to become astronauts. There are millions of kids all over the world looking up at the stars right now with hope. And somewhere along the way, they're going to give up on ever having a relationship with space. You may be thinking, who cares? I mean, if kids give up on being astronauts, you know, we don't need millions of people living in space and working in space. But what if we do? I work for the Science and Technology Policy Institute. We're a federally funded research and development center, and we advise the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and federal agencies like NASA. At STIPI, part of my job every day is to tackle this question. Who do we need working in space? Space has become a critical part of our society in ways that we all take for granted. We use space to, to monitor our crops, to provide internet to rural communities, and to help us better understand climate change. So while you may imagine the space community just as astrophysicists and rocket scientists, it is a much bigger community with a broader effect on our economy than you might imagine. And it's the economists, the doctors, lawyers, biologists, and policy nerds like me to, that help make the decisions that further humanity's future in space. You may have heard people tell you that we live in an interdisciplinary world, and my goal here today is to tell you that that interdisciplinary world does not end at the atmosphere. We all have a place in space. I didn't know this when I was a kid. I thought a little bit about space back when Pluto got demoted from being a planet, but otherwise, I didn't think about space that much. That changed when I was 16, and my team's experiment was selected as part of the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program. If you're not familiar with the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program, or SSEP, it's a program of the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education. And this program allows kids to send experiments of their own design to the International Space Station and to have real astronauts perform these experiments in space. How cool is that? Kids across the world, across the country, as young as the fourth grade, get to work with scientists and their peers in the spirit of intellectual inquiry. And all we had to do was promise not to blow everything up. My friends and I designed an experiment on tin whiskers. Tin whiskers are this small, crystalline, electrically conductive structure. And these little hairs can grow on circuitry and destroy electronics. They even grounded the Space Shuttle Endeavor for a few months. And tin whiskers aren't just a problem in space. They're a problem here on the ground, too. And they even caused a recall of pacemakers. And out of all the things you can get recalled, you really don't want your pacemaker to be. When we wrote this proposal, we didn't think anything would come of it. But the scientists who evaluate proposals for the Student Spaceflight Experiments program, they liked our idea and picked us to go to space. I was stunned. I always thought of myself as a humanities kid. And there I was getting that call that our experiment was going to space. Over the next year, we immersed ourselves in building our experiment, traveling to visit our mentors at NASA, filling out NASA safety paperwork, and presenting at the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program Conference, all in preparation for the moment we were most excited for, 
our launch. And I know I shouldn't call it our launch. It was an international space station resupply mission, and it had hundreds of experiments and cargo on it. Our experiment was just a small piece of that. But to us, it felt like our rocket, and it felt like our launch. I don't know if y'all have ever been to a launch. You may imagine a sterile control room filled with you know, nerds and scientists in white coats, you know, pocket protectors, horn rim glasses. But my first launch was basically a tailgate. We packed fold-up chairs and food and speakers, and we waited with a few hundred other people across the river from the launch pad, ready to see this 140-foot-tall Antares rocket leave the Earth to go to a lab floating in the sky. And if you've never seen a launch, it can be hard to describe. So rather than waste y'all's time trying to explain how it looks, I'm just going to show y'all. Join me across the river for the Antares rocket, T minus two to launch. Four, three, two, one. <laughs> CRS mission to the ISF. That main engine's at 108 percent. DVI power normal. And launch team, launch team, be advised, stay at your consoles. Everyone in the LCC main. If you're wondering if the rocket was supposed to be consumed in a giant ball of fire, it wasn't. <laughs> what you just saw was the culmination of the work of so many people and millions of dollars of international space station supplies consumed in flames. The experiment that we thought was going to space was in smoke above our heads. It was disappointing. It was hard but we were given a second chance. With the support of our family and friends and our NASA mentors, we prepared our experiment again. And we had people reach out to offer the support that you may not expect. The priest from my church even offered to lead a prayer for us before our launch. So we built it again. We went down to the launch pad, and this time, the SpaceX 7 ascended from the launch pad, hurtling into the atmosphere and out of our sights. As we cheered and we hugged and high-fived, I got a call from my grandma. She said, Rachel, I'm so sorry your experiment exploded. I was touched. I was like, Grandma, I really appreciate that. That was last year, and you know, we just made it today. And in a moment burned in my brain, she said, no, Rachel, I'm sorry it blew up again. What we couldn't see from the ground but that people watching at home on TV could see the SpaceX 7 exploded two minutes into launch, high above our heads. And I'll save you all from watching that video, because take it from me, seeing one rocket explosion is enough for a lifetime. It was hard. And you may be wondering if someone would give us a chance a third time. I even felt like giving up at that point. I was pretty convinced I might be bad luck. <laughs> but when we got home to South Carolina, we got a call from the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program team. And they were carrying a message to us from all of the community members who helped us get to this point. Don't give up. We are going to get you guys to space. And I'm pretty sick of the phrase, third time's a charm, but in this case, it was. We prepared our experiment one last time. We crossed our fingers and our toes, and this time, the SpaceX 8 made it to space on April 8th, 2016, carrying our experiment with it. <laughs> and I know all of this can be hard to imagine, but I want to stress, I wasn't some wonderkind, and neither were my teammates. Sometimes when we imagine these STEM programs, we envision eight-year-olds doing calculus in their coloring books, or 15-year-olds in, in labs curing obscure cancers. And these images of unapproachable geniuses, 
they're harmful because they can scare people away from space and they can scare people away from science. I'm telling you all this story about how I was given an incredible opportunity, but it wasn't because I was extraordinary. I went to underfunded public schools in South Carolina. I was an ordinary kid given an extraordinary opportunity. And for us ordinary kids to have the chance to send something to space, it was beyond belief. It awoke passions for us in science and in space that we didn't know could exist. And all of that culminated in our launch, or launches. I thank the Student Space Flight Experiments Program every day for teaching me, an ordinary kid, that my place is in space, that all of our places can be in space, and we can all advance the final frontier. Space has never been more critical than it is right now. If you look up at the night sky tonight, you can see pinpricks of light that are planets and galaxies and stars. But very soon, one out of every 15 lights that you see in the sky will be a satellite. Tracking the weather, helping you to watch the big game in HD, and even helping us conduct research to discover new drugs or to grow organs in space. This is also hard to imagine, but there's a laboratory the size of a football field, 200 miles above our heads right now with eight people living and working on it. There will never be another moment in human history where there are not people living and working in space. And if you're here in the audience and you're 22 years old or younger, there has never been a single moment of your life where there weren't people living in space. And space is our shared, our shared future, but that future is fragile. You may wonder how something as infinite as the cosmos can be fragile, yet it is. Here we are in Florida, just a stone's throw from the beach, and when you look out into the ocean, even if you can't see it, you know there's an immense amount of trash and pollution in it. And just the same, Right above our heads, humans have left millions of pieces of trash. And this trash ranges in size from entire rocket bodies down to tiny flecks of paint. And on Earth, we don't care about trash that small, but a piece of space junk the size of a cherry pit carries the explosive power of a grenade when it's traveling 17,000 miles per hour. And those laboratories and satellites I was telling you all about, they make up 10% of the man-made objects in space. The rest, the other 90%, is space junk. And that is just one of the many challenges that we face in space. And engineering and math, they'll be important tools to tackle these problems, but they're not going to be the only ones. If you're wondering what happened to me after the launch, no, I didn't become an astronaut. I didn't need to. There are so many challenges that we face in space, and they're going to be tackled by a lot of different people. It's not going to be one person that will further our future in space, and it's not going to be one type of person either. We all can have a place in space if we can find it. Thank you. <laughs>